Hello, my name is Jonathan A. Mason, Sr., the international president of Phi Beta Sigma Fraternity Incorporated. And I'm coming to you today from Atlanta, Georgia, in a historic place to members of Phi Beta Sigma Fraternity. It's the historic Sigma Zeta Foundation, home of the Lambda Sigma chapter, home of five past international presidents of Phi Beta Sigma Fraternity Incorporated. We're here today, and I'm, I'm really excited to be here because I'm sitting next to not only African-American history, but living American history in the person of Dr. William E. Harbor. And, and, and I want to share with you very quickly how a moment makes a difference. Just a few months ago, I was watching the Eyes on the Prize series. I'd seen it when I was a child, and I decided I wanted to watch it through again. And for a very brief second in the film, a gentleman comes across the camera in a Phi Beta Sigma sweater. So I froze the television, and I took a picture with my phone, and I put it up on Facebook, and I said, does anyone know this brother? Well, after hundreds of responses, we finally found out that the brother that was walking across the screen was none other than William E. Harbor, who joined the Zeta Alpha chapter at Tennessee State University in April of 1962. I'm also going to give another secret. He was born on January the 9th, right. 1942. <clears throat> So he had no other choice than to become a man of Phi Beta Sigma Fraternity Incorporated. Brother Harbor, it's been a while trying to put this interview together. Right. I'm so thankful we're here today. Good afternoon. Pleased to meet you. Thank you very much. If you don't mind, I want to jump right in. Mm -hmm. You were born in Piedmont, Alabama, January 9th, 1942. Now, we've got a lot of young men in Phi Beta Sigma Fraternity Incorporated. Mm -hmm. And they may not be aware of what the segregated South was like in 1942. That's correct. Tell us a little bit what, about what it was like growing up in Piedmont, Alabama in 1942. First, let me start with the fact that uh, Piedmont had only three lights and four stop signs and less than uh, 10,000 uh, citizens when I, when, I uh, when I was in Piedmont. Uh, it was a great place. Everybody knew everybody. However, the school was segregated. Uh, I drove, matter of fact, I drove a school bus. Okay. And I had to drive past the white school house to get to the black school house. And it was amazing that during that time, it didn't, it didn't, we didn't think anything about it because it was a way of life until I got to Tennessee State University. Uh, we didn't have too much problem in Piedmont when the uh, schools were integrated. But however, uh, I guess I thought about the fact that I didn't want leave to leave home uh, to go too far away from school. So I applied to Jacksonville State University, which is 12 miles from my house in Piedmont, from where I live in Piedmont. And lo and behold, they sent my application back, says, you cannot come to this university. That was in 1960. So that's how I got to, uh, got to uh, Nashville, Tennessee. Matter of fact, listen, let me tell you this. Five years ago, after being turned down from uh, entering Jacksonville State University, I did the commencement exercise for Jacksonville State. Isn't that something? Can't believe it. That's something. Additionally, since that time, my brother had finished Jacksonville State. My sister, one of my sisters finished Jacksonville State. Uh, my sister-in-law got a master in Jacksonville State. So. Uh, a lot of changes have been made. A lot of changes have been made. But I definitely want to go to Jacksonville State. I had my little car from high school and didn't want to sell it. And I was going to drive to school every day. Plus, it was going to save me money. Uh, but since that didn't happen, that's how I went to Tennessee State. And something special happened at Tennessee State. And I'm going to get there for a minute, in a minute. But Brother Harbor was a freedom rider. That's correct. Boarded the buses in 1961 was very active in the civil rights movement. And we're going to talk about all of that okay. here this afternoon. But before we get to you becoming one of the trailblazing civil rights leaders of our time, we got to go back to Piedmont. Oh, okay. Your daddy was a barber. 
That's correct. Your mother, she cooked in houses for white folks. That's right. Uh, the, uh, and I'm taking it uh, right off of the uh, off of the, uh, the information. <laughs> right. Um, right. How did you end up breaking the chain? What made you want to break the chain and go to college in mm -hmm. a day and age where most young men in the 40s and in the 50s and the 60s left right. school early, didn't get their high school diplomas? You actually matriculated to Tennessee State. How did you get that burning desire? Well, one of the things I wanted to do, uh, we had several people that, uh, that dropped out of school, especially my friends and so forth, and a lot of them went to the Army. But I felt like I wanted to go to college to make a difference. I'm the first one in my family to attend college, first one out of eight. And I wanted to make a difference and, and make some changes, in, uh, especially in my family. And after I, after I started Tennessee State, then my sister came to Tennessee State and taught there 40 years. Um, my other baby sister finished Tennessee State. My son finished Tennessee State. Five nieces and nephews finished Tennessee State. So I was a trailblazer for the whole family going to Tennessee State. Not only that, I was the first one from my hometown to attend Tennessee State. Most of the students from my hometown went to Alabama State University, uh, Jackson, uh, uh, Tuskegee, uh, a and M, but nobody had gone to Tennessee State. Hmm. But now you told me you went there to major in history. Correct. And uh, but then, as a student majoring in history, some way somehow you shifted, and you joined the Nashville Christian Leadership Conference. Now mm -hmm. you went there to get an education. That's right. But yet you joined a civil rights organization. How'd that happen? Yeah, uh, I was telling you one thing about uh, back during that time, uh, you can only be a teacher or a preacher. And I know I couldn't preach like you. <laughs> so I decided to go ahead and, and, and become a uh, teacher. I, um, I met Congressman John Lewis after one of the uh, sessions we had at the uh, Theological Seminary. John was attending the seminary. And John's from Alabama also, from Troy, Alabama. And after church one afternoon, uh, we was invited to to come to a meeting. And that's where I met Congressman John Lewis. And he said, Bill, why don't we uh, just, uh, why don't you just come to the meeting with us uh, every once in a while. Pretty soon I, I joined the movement in Nashville, Tennessee, mm -hmm. along with Congressman John Lewis. First time I went to jail in Nashville was with Congressman John Lewis. Hmm. Now, I, I gotta ask you, how did your parents feel uh, uh, about the fact that you left Piedmont, went to Tennessee State, and then got involved in the movement. It was amazing that at the present time, people very seldom talk about the fact that your parents had problems just like we did in Nashville, Tennessee. My mother was afraid. My mother got fired from her job uh, when I joined the movement. My father was questioned many times about his job, although he uh, he went you know his major money came from the barber shop. He was a, he was one of the only black barbers in the whole town. So Paris had a lot of problems too beside the students during, during that time. Mm. And, 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 and Congressman Lewis, uh, great civil rights icon. Right. Uh, we've, uh, he often tells the story of how he used to preach to the chickens <laughs> right. uh, in Troy, Alabama. That's correct. Uh, but it, it's such a blessing to still have him here. Uh, seems like he was a great influence on your life. Definitely so. He was a person that uh, seemed like he never was afraid. Anytime we marched downtown in Nashville, anytime we were sped on, uh, beat with, uh, with bats and, and uh, John was always in the head. He was always leading. He was a great person. He knew where he was going and he influenced us quite a bit to make sure that uh, we stayed with the movement. And, it's, and, and it was interesting, when we first spoke, right. uh, you shared with me and, and, I, and, and I just, I, I, I don't know if you realize I kind of went speechless. <laughs> but you shared with me that you were just at Reverend C.T. Vivian's house. That's correct. Uh, and it was you, Reverend Vivian, mm -hmm. Hank Thomas, That's John correct. Lewis, all sitting in a circle. And yeah. I said, Lord, if I could have just been a fly <laughs> on the wall. Right, but it's, right. See, I mean, what is it like to, I'm jumping ahead, mm -hmm. but what is it like to, to be here in Atlanta and have all of those Mm -hmm. important civil rights icons right here with you today, still living and still able to tell the story. Oh, it's great. Uh, Hank Thomas often invited us to his house. And you know, Hank was one of the uh, 
Only, only person still living that was on the bus that was burned. We'll get into that later too. But uh, it's, it's great to see people like uh, C.T. Vivian, who's uh, 90, what, 92 years old, 92. and still getting around, which is, which is also great. Uh, uh, Reverend Vivian was one of the major, uh, I guess, older uh, uh, people that was in the movement. He, uh, he was married, he was in Nashville, already married. We were still students at 19 years old when I got in the movement. But uh, Reverend Vivian was married and had a, had a family. But he still made sure that, uh, that he, he marched with us, went to jail with us, and stayed in the movement all the same time. And, 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 and many people who may not be aware of who Reverend Vivian is, all you have to do is pull up Eyes on the Prize or, oh, right. or any of that black and white footage of him standing in the face of power. That's correct. And, and telling them that he had a right and the people had a right to vote. You know, when we first started talking, uh, about the potential of doing this interview. Uh, I, know, I know you reached out when you got my voice message right. uh, to one of your homeboys from Piedmont, uh, right. Brother Hugh Van Ball. And, yes. uh, and we certainly want to thank him for making this, uh, this, uh, this opportunity come to fruition. I'm mm -hmm. sure he called you and said, that Mason, he all right. He's all right. <laughs> but, but when yeah. we first talked, yeah. um, mm -hmm. you had shared with me that just the night before, uh, mm -hmm. you were at, I believe, Reverend Vivian's house. Uh, mm -hmm. with Reverend C.T. Vivian, mm -hmm. Hank Thomas, mm -hmm. John Lewis, and yourself. Right, right. Now, for anybody that's watching that does not know any of those names, just go to Google uh, and mm -hmm. look them up. But, right. but my question to you is, what's it like in 2016 to still be mm -hmm. able to sit at the table with, with these men that helped to set the stage for all of the benefits that we right. have today. It's, it's amazing. I just can't believe that uh, after all these many years, and with the age of, well, C.T. Vivian is 90-something years old, and uh, I'm not a spring chicken, though. I'm 74 myself. <laughs> so we've been around a long time, mm -hmm. but it's, it's great to get together with all of them, and especially in Atlanta, Georgia. We got something like... Um, uh, seven freedom riders that, that went to jail and went to prison just in Atlanta, Georgia. And we got amazing civil rights leaders in Atlanta, Georgia that uh, they're doing a lot of speaking. I know a lot of speaking. And these young, young students can learn from. What's your travel like uh, on uh, a consistent basis? Are you all over the place? Uh, doing all the time. Yeah. All the time. Uh, I probably spoke to more than uh, 7,000 students this year doing black history. And not only just students, uh, I'm in different, different churches, uh, out of town, and we'll talk about my other project down in Alabama. Absolutely. But uh, traveling, it's all the time. I'm going to give you a name. What's that? Diane Nash. Diane was one of the students in Nashville, Tennessee. Matter of fact, Diane helped, helped uh, put together the movement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we'll talk about the fact that she was one of the instruments in, in putting together the Freedom Ride. Mm -hmm. But Diane was from, from Chicago, plus she, uh, she kept the movement going. She was a great force, and she was from Fisher University in, hear, that, in, in she, Nashville, Tennessee. I hear she was a spark plug. Oh, she was great. Oh, gosh. She was definitely great. All right. Mm -hmm. She had a major influence on moving the, uh, the mission of the movement That's correct. Nashville. That's correct. Okay. That's correct. Talk to me a little bit about the Freedom Rides. Now, it's 1961. You're at Tennessee mm -hmm. State University. As I've shared already, you've joined the Nashville Christian Leadership Conference. Right. Uh, and then you start to have meetings about how you can affect change. That's uh, correct. How were you convinced to get on those Greyhound buses? What took place leading up to that, those mm -hmm. historic freedom rides? Let me start from the beginning. Uh, we had just completed uh, probably one of the most historic changes in Nashville, Tennessee. We met with the mayor and the mayor said he was going to do a proclamation to integrate downtown um, restaurants and swimming pools and so forth. And we was back from, from that. The Freedom, Ride, the Freedom Ride started in Washington, D.C. And what happened is we had completed a lot of the, uh, uh, the demonstration we had, had gone on. We knew that uh, the segregated South, knew that the segregated buses. Matter of fact, let me, let me tell you about this. I used to ride the bus to Nashville. And when I got to Huntsville, Alabama, 
I had to stand up for, uh, for the next 40 miles and stand up on the bus in the back because blacks couldn't, couldn't move up front no further than, than an imaginary line. And when, when the older uh, black folks got on, you know, we, we got up and gave them our seat. So, so one of the things that, that bothered me when I went to Nashville, because uh, you had to stand up on, on the back of the bus. But the Freedom Ride started uh, from Washington, D.C. It was two buses, Greyhound bus and Trailway bus. It was 13, 12 or 13 on, uh, divided on both buses. Now, I like to tell folks, make sure you understand that these were not chartered buses. It was regular Greyhound buses, regular Trailway buses. So what happened is they were going to test the system throughout the South. The laws had been passed, but nobody was carrying out the laws, not even uh, the Congress, uh, White House, the Justice Department. Nobody wanted to test, test the laws. So the buses left Washington, D.C., and they had planned to come, go through Virginia, uh, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, and New Orleans. They had very small problems, very little problems, uh, on the way down until they got to Georgia. They got off and met with Dr. King. Dr. King said, well, y'all need to be careful because it appears that some trouble lies ahead. So they left uh, Sunday morning and went into Alabama. That was Anniston, Alabama, which is, uh, and moved into the bus station. And when they got to the bus station on Mother's Day, a crowd began to gather around the buses. One bus went on to uh, Birmingham, which is the uh, trailway. But the Greyhound bus went to the bus station in Anniston. They began to punch the tires on the bus. They laid down in front of the bus and wouldn't move. So eventually, the bus moved out the highway. A lot of people say, you can't believe that it was on Mother's Day. And some of these folks had come from church. High in these days, on Mother's Day, come from church with the Sunday go meeting clothes on, spit sign shoes, and would be so hateful to set a bus on fire. The bus went out the highway about five miles and had a flat tire. The same crew followed the bus at the highway. And when they caught the bus, they held a dough and, uh, and threw a bomb inside and, and, began to, and the bus began to burn. The only reason, Hank would say, the only reason they, they, uh, they let them off the bus because a tank blew up in the back of the bus and they thought they was gonna get blown away too. Mm -hmm. So they finally got off the bus with seven, uh, seven students and try to go to the hospital in Anderson, Alabama, and they refused them. Eventually, they went to the hospital, uh, Reverend Shutterworth, so they grew up to pick them up, and they eventually went to a hospital in, uh, in Birmingham. The word went around that uh, the Freedom Ride was over, not realizing that the students in Nashville, Tennessee, was getting ready to grab that bus. The next morning, we called all of our, our leaders. They said, no, so you shouldn't go. It's too dangerous. You know, Dr. King said, this. he said, well, it's too dangerous. The White House, uh, the Kennedy brothers, uh, they said, let's, let's cool off for a while. But we, the students in Nashville, Tennessee, said, no, nope. if we let them stop us now, then all our progress we made will be turned back. So we had to take the Freedom Ride. We loaded the bus two days later and headed out to Birmingham, Alabama. We got to the, the Alabama line. Bull Connor, who was a famous police chief, stopped the bus in the middle of the highway. Got on the bus and said, he gave us the old, good old boy story. He said, why don't y'all turn around and go back home? He said, he saw two students sitting on the front, Jim Swerks, and John Lewis took him off the bus and took him to jail. Eventually, uh, he let the bus go into Birmingham. And we got to the station, they put newspaper up on all the windows. 
because people began to crowd around. And then he decided to say, well, if y'all go into the colored waiting room, the colored waiting side, then we'll let y'all off the bus. We said, definitely we'll go because it's getting hot on the bus and, and uh, we wanted to get off. We got off the bus and went immediately straight into the white waiting room. And gee, everybody started coming around. Brother Harvey, let me go back a little bit. Okay. The Kennedy brothers, mm -hmm. president and attorney general. Mm -hmm. uh, if you really go back and do the research, uh, it's pretty clear that they really weren't marching anywhere. Oh, that's uh, right. they, they looked at civil rights in many cases as, as, as an annoyance. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. But time and politics put them in a position that's correct. Where history, in many cases, now records them as as leadership that really started mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The, right. the 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 acceptance of uh, of the movement. Um, what were your reflections, uh, thoughts of, of the president and the attorney general uh, at that point in time? Now, one of the things that uh, back during uh, the '60s, if you go into any black house in the South. They always had a picture up there with, with President Kennedy and Dr. King. And that was because uh, when Dr. King was in jail, you know, they made the call uh, to get him out, to, to plan to get him out and so forth. So a lot of black folks thought that, that the Kennedys was one of the saving graces for black folks mm -hmm. back during the 1960s. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, but now we, if you do some research on it, uh, it was a little different. You know, I can look at it a little different now, uh, but we just didn't know anything about it yeah. at that time. Many mm -hmm. people don't know that really what it was at that point was a race to see right. who could get Dr. King out of prison uh, because Nixon was actually a friend of That's Dr. Right. King's. Mm -hmm. He was the sitting vice president preparing to try to beat Kennedy. Uh, and, um, and the Kennedy brothers, uh, as a result of Colonel Shriver, were yeah. able to, they, they were convinced to make the call uh, to Coretta Scott King and then, and then Bobby Kennedy got him out. Uh, so it's just interesting how politics right, that's plays right. into that mm -hmm. situation mm -hmm. because the Republican Party really was the party of civil rights oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. up until the Kennedy brothers. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we moved to the Democratic Party. But I also want to ask you a, a, another question um, relative to that time period. Uh, 1961 Freedom Rise, that first bus that went into Aniston. We spoke a little bit earlier. Hank Thomas is the only one that's still living. Still living. That was time. on that bus. That's correct. Uh, and we talked about some of some of the people that actually reached out to help those freedom mm -hmm. riders that were mm -hmm. gasping for breath and trying to save their lives. Talk to mm -hmm. us about the young lady from California. Yeah, a young lady named uh, Jana Fosight at that time. Her father owned the uh, owned a service station. When the bus got out the highway about five miles and, and the tires went flat, uh, and they set the bus on fire, uh, and, and they finally got the Freedom Riders off the bus. Uh, Hank was gasping for breath, and, and things were just going on real, real quick. But Jane Forsythe uh, was a young white girl, a Caucasian young lady, about 12 years old. She saw what was happening, and she went back to her house and got water for the Freedom Riders. And Hank Thomas tells a story you remember so well, how Janie uh, helped save his life because uh, he was in trouble as far as the water and so forth. Uh, and also other, other, other people that was on the bus. You know, Janie had a lot of nerves. I don't know if she knew any better or what, but back during that time in 1961, uh, and I've often heard stories too that when she did that, her family caught a lot of problems too. And she eventually moved uh, moved from Alabama. Mm. And Janie lives in, in California now. We talk to her uh, probably once every three months. Uh, she come in when we call her. And there's a famous picture of her holding a young lady in her arms and mm -hmm. giving her- I think that was Janie, yeah. So it's, you know, it's, it's amazing that some of these people are still here today, still living, right. uh, mm -hmm. and still left to tell the story. Let's talk about your bus. You refused to mm -hmm. to stop. Uh, the leadership tried to get you to stop. Dr. King tried to get you to stop. The White House tried to get your team to stop. But you all decided to get on the bus and go down to Alabama. 
Mm -hmm. uh, you shared earlier that you were met by Bull Carter. Yes. Uh, but now you got into Birmingham. I want to. Mm -hmm. I want you to pick up the story from there because our those that are watching they need to know what happened to okay. you when you arrived in mm -hmm. Birmingham. Yeah, uh, we, we arrived in Birmingham, and they wouldn't let us off the bus until we made an agreement. But then we broke that agreement and and went on into the white side of the bus station. It's amazing they had uh, major signs up, white and colored, and and even after we we uh, left Birmingham, it still took time uh, for black folks in the area. I guess they were just afraid to really uh, uh, go in the white side of the waiting room. But we'll talk about that. That's it's one of the things that <coughs> that uh, we always worried about, especially on all the demonstrations we had and everywhere we went, that. Uh, the local people who lived there had to do something after we left. And a lot of them were just afraid to do it. But anyway, we stayed in the bus station, uh, got in the bus station, and the crowds began to uh, come around. And, and you could see the policemen and, with the big, vicious dogs walking around on the outside of the bus station. And about 11 o'clock that night, Bull Connor came in. Bull Connor is one of the, one of the <laughs> I guess, one of the vicious police chiefs you can find anywhere in the world. He came in and said, okay, y'all get up, you're going to jail. So wait a minute, for what? He said, for your own protection. So he took us out and took us to jail. And we stayed in jail that night, the next night, and early the next morning around 12 or 1 o'clock, Bill Connor came in, he said, uh, y'all get up, I'm taking you back to Tennessee. They put us in two limousines and another car and headed back uh, to, towards Tennessee, towards Nashville. We thought we was going to Tennessee. Early that morning, about six o'clock, still dark, they stopped on the railroad track and put us out. We didn't know if, uh, <laughs> if the Ku Klux Klan was following us. We didn't know uh, Catherine Burke was also in the car, Catherine from Birmingham. She said we had stopped, I guess I dozed off. She said we had stopped and picked up a priest I said, gee, Captain, I would have had a heart attack if I'd known that and picked up a priest. But anyway, he put us out on the railroad track. And we realized that we had to find a house, a black family, so we can get a telephone to call Nashville, Tennessee to pick us up. We walked down the railroad track and Congressman John Lewis and we got seven of us. And I told uh, Congressman Lewis, look, we, if we go on the other side of the track, Back in the 60s, that was black folks live across the track. You remember everybody talk about that. So we saw a house, a little shotgun type house. The light was on in the back. And two of us, uh, John and myself, went and knocked on the front door. A man came to the door and we told him that we need to use the telephone. We was the Freedom Riders. And he said, mm-mm, mm-mm, don't come in here. So he closed the door on us. So Catherine and Holly, knock on it again, knock on it again. Said, let his wife come to the door. We did that. His wife came to the door. And she looked up at us and says, y'all chillings, come on in. Took us in, fed us. One of the things that we had to do, especially back during that time, you had to uh, have your own codes and stuff. We had that. And maybe later on get a chance to talk about codes. Nobody lived in the house but, uh, but the uh, wife and the husband. Now, back in the 60s, you, you went to town one time, got all your groceries for the week, and maybe didn't go to town again until the next week. So the lady said, well, I'm going to feed y'all breakfast. So she sent her husband up, up town and gave him a list, two lists. You get this from this store this from this store, and this from this store. Because they realized that if there's only two of them in the house and they just bought groceries that weekend, mm -hmm. you know, they must have uh, something going on. The family must be down visit, or must be the Freedom Riders there. And so that's what she did. Fed us, we uh, called at the Nashville, Tennessee, got a car, and headed back to uh, Birmingham. Well, we had planned to go back to Nashville, Tennessee, but we talked about it. And that was our second uh, major thing we, uh, we, we did. But then we realized that, why do that? 
We left and went back to Birmingham again. And we got back to Birmingham, Reverend Shuttleworth met us with uh, four or five more students from Nashville, Tennessee. Went back to the bus station again and stayed there all night long. That night, all day the next day, all day the next day. They would not give a, well none of the bus drivers would take us on into Birmingham. Mm -hmm. And as you know back during that time, there was no black bus drivers anyway. Mm -hmm. So the Kennedys on the phone, and everybody was talking about where can we get a bus driver to take the Freedom Riders in. One of the bus drivers says, I'm not going to give my life for core NAACP or no damn Freedom Riders. And it's too dangerous for me, so he quit. Eventually, three days later, we got a bus, got a driver out to Montgomery, Alabama. When we left Birmingham, it was two policemen on the front of, in the front of the bus, four in the back of the bus in cars. We had a helicopter flying on top of the bus, and every every five miles down the highway, there was a state trooper sitting on the side of the road. When we got to Montgomery, Alabama, to the city limits, everybody faded. No policemen, no helicopter, or nowhere. We pull into the bus station, and in less than three minutes, a whole world of folks came out. I mean, just looked like it just, they just dropped out of the sky with so many of them. They went to beating us, you know, blood ran down the street. If you see the film, a picture of John, uh, Congressman Lewis and also Jim Swerks, it was tough. Matter of fact, the whites beat the other white freedom riders with us and Western did us because they thought they was traitors. It was amazing that nobody got killed. Jim Swerves had a uh, broken back, a spine, had a chip spine, uh, ribs uh, messed up. I had uh, three fractured ribs, uh, cuts and bruises. Uh, matter of fact, I still got scars now. One of the pretty scars from the, from, uh, from the freedom ride. Yeah. Anyway, we uh, eventually we were eventually uh, taken to different houses in the community. Now, one of the things that people didn't realize, back in the 60s, Montgomery probably had a hotel, but you didn't have any hotels for black folks in, in small towns. You know, everybody stayed with their relatives and so forth. But the next day, uh, Dr. King flew in. We were having a major mass meeting, and he had called and said he would be there. That night, even after all the, the beatings in, in, uh, in Montgomery and so forth, the church was full of community folks because they wanted to make, see what the Freedom Riders looked like, I guess, some of them. And then a lot of, a lot of them just wanted to make sure that, that they want to be part of the uh, history as in Montgomery. A mob began to flow, uh, uh, gather outside the church in Montgomery. They began to turn over cars, and the cars began to burn, set cars on fire outside the church. You can see through the glass stained windows the fire and that, was, that was going on on the outside. Dr. King got on the phone to President Kennedy and told the president that uh, we need protection. If not, a lot of us are going to burn up in the church. The president called... Uh, Patterson at that time, and told him to protect his Freedom Riders. Governor John Patterson. Governor John Patterson, and told him to protect the Freedom Riders. And Patterson refused to call. He said he was gone fishing somewhere. Anyway, later he called him back again, and Patterson eventually sent uh, uh, troopers in. It was not only troopers, they, uh, they fertilized the National Guard. And a guard came in and picked us up on big trucks and buses and took us to different places in the community and stood guard and watched all day and night until, uh, until we decided uh, to have me another meeting with Dr. King. Mm -hmm. now, now, talk to me about that second meeting. Ah, right. Uh, because I believe uh, you were attempting the riders to convince Dr. King uh, to, to, to ride, 
uh, as, as a symbol of what this movement meant. W what happened in that second meeting? Yeah, okay, one of the things that, um, that uh, we felt, and a lot of us felt, it was in two different meetings, that, that if Dr. King were going to Freedom Ride with us, then that would be a major, major help with us, especially going into Mississippi. And Dr. King uh, decided he wasn't going to go. Uh, one of the things that he was still on probation, and, and we, was on, we was on probation too, but uh, then I felt one time after that is that, that Dr. King would probably do a lot better on the outside than going in, after, you know, after we go to Mississippi, I'll tell you about that. So uh, he refused to go on the trip. We left Montgomery and we had the National Guard not only following us on the bus, but we had the National Guard inside the bus when we got to Mississippi. We got to Mississippi, we was taken off the bus and went into, and went to jail. We went through the bus station and they said, well, we're not going to feed you. We're not going give to you, give you a sandwich. I was, I was asking for a sandwich and a Coke and they took us straight to jail. The next morning, you know, people started coming uh, for miles around. The next morning we had a trial and they said that uh, you'll find $200 or six to seven days in jail. We refused, that's the third day we did, we refused to pay the $200 and we said we're going to serve the six to seven days in jail. It's amazing that the word got around. It was in summertime. People came from all around. Students came throughout the United States. We had students from, from uh, 38 states in the United States, 48 states at that time, I guess. We even had students from five foreign countries that came to Mississippi hmm. to go to jail. Uh, it was amazing. We filled the jails, and when there was no more room, they, put us, they took us to Poshman, Mississippi, Poshman Penitentiary. That's where you see the Bob Wives and all that stuff, and we was in penitentiary. Okay. Uh, not only that, we refused to uh, walk and they used caliprods. You know, caliprods that prod the cattle and make them, make them move and so forth. Uh, it, was, it was amazing. Now, in Potion, we had uh, good food because uh, down doing it, well, pretty good food, I guess. Uh, during that time, they had the uh, prisoners to work the fields and they grew uh, great vegetables and everything else. But Potion was tough. It was really tough. Let me, let me, let me, let me deviate for just a second. Mm -hmm. You know, the whole call of the movement was a nonviolent movement. Correct. You know, for civil rights for our people. My father, uh, who pastored uh, for 50 plus years in Philadelphia, uh, he marched with uh, Dr. King, in, or he went to mm -hmm. Cicero to march with Dr. King. Uh, and he, tells, he told the story of how Dr. King wouldn't let him march mm. because he wouldn't take his pistol out of his holster. <laughs> right. uh, and, he, and, mm. and they had had a meeting where everybody who carried a pistol had to take their pistol out. My dad said, they're not, they not going to beat me. I'm going to carry my pistol. <laughs> right. So they made him stay at the hotel. Mm -hmm. How did you maintain the nonviolent model in the midst of all of the hatred Mm -hmm. uh, all of mm -hmm. the beatings. How did you? How did you? How did you maintain your posture and not attempt to fight back? Right. It was one of the things about the uh, movement nonviolence. Uh, you can have nonviolence for a tactic, which will help you get over, uh, help you uh, do some, make some changes. But then you can have nonviolence for a way of life. Congressman John Lewis, nonviolence was for a way of life. No matter what happened, he was never going to fight back. We were not going to fight back. One of the things I tell students now when I speak to them is, well, how y'all let them beat y'all like that? Well, even if we had, 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 had fought back, then that would get other, other students in trouble, other people in trouble. We didn't have enough guns, uh, enough power to overcome what, uh, uh, the major uh, problem during that time. So you had to use nonviolence, and which was a uh, uh, thing that, uh, that was coming out of India about gun and so forth which changed the country, changed the world. Uh, uh, I, uh, I made up my mind when I joined the movement that I was not going to fight back no matter what happened. Mm -hmm. you, talk, you said for somebody like Cicero, uh, I marched with Dr. King in Chicago, mm -hmm. and you're talking about me. Mm -hmm. It was tough. Yeah. It was real tough. We marched in uh, 
put a housing part in Chicago and I remember they, uh, somebody started shooting and uh, we had to huddle Dr. King over and I touched him on the shoulder. I could feel him trembling. It was so bad. It was, I could feel him trembling because Dr. King will always tell you, everybody afraid sometimes. Mm -hmm. And we was afraid sometimes in Mississippi. But what happened is that um, after being in, in, in jail for 49, in, in prison for 49 days in Mississippi, then we needed some students to, uh, to get out early and come back and test the system and go to court in Jackson, Mississippi. So I was one of the students that they selected to, to uh, get out early and come back to Jackson, Mississippi. Additionally, I had planned to go to law school, and so they wanted to make sure that not on my record, so when I got out of school. So I got, I got out of jail in, Nashville, in, a, in, in Parkson, Mississippi, went back to Nashville to go back to school, received a letter from the president and says that you've been expelled. Gee, now I can't go home, been, been in my, my little small town now, and especially when, when uh, a lot of black folks saying he shouldn't have been doing that. And everybody knew what happened in a small town. Got the letter from the president, 14 of us have spelled from Tennessee State University. Tennessee State is operated by a board of regions Matter of fact, it wasn't Tennessee State at that time. It was Tennessee A and I, in industrial, uh, a uh, agriculture and industrial at that time. So the Board of Regents told the president, who's a black president, that uh, to put us out of school. We demonstrated. We marched, and finally we we uh, filed a petition against the Board of Regents, and and went to court. One other case. At that time, I'd been uh, tra I'd transferred to Central State. They had given me a full scholarship at Central State. Came back to Tennessee State and still graduated in four years at Tennessee State. Now, one of the things that happens to, to the students, matter of fact, after that, after I uh, uh, came back to Tennessee State and graduated, uh, before I graduated in 1962, that's when I joined Phi Beta Sigma. And we had, uh, Probably four or five. I remember four more uh, brothers that uh, didn't go on the freedom ride. Didn't go to jail, but they was in demonstrations in Nashville uh, during that time. But didn't go on the freedom ride. So I want to get to Sigma in a second, but mm -hmm. I want to give you an address, Brother Harvey. Okay. Four hundred Washington Avenue in Montgomery, Alabama. Old bus station. That old Greyhound bus station. <laughs> right. Right. Tell me what you feel when you hear that address. I was bound back to. Um, I've been in Montgomery several times, and what happened is they have uh, started turning that into a museum. Uh, my pictures on the wall, on the outside of the wall, uh, well, a lot of people pictures on the outside of the wall that, that was first, who first went into Montgomery, uh, uh, that bus station. We we're also doing some things to help them out uh, as far as uh, uh, doing sound films and doing books and so forth in Montgomery. So that's a good place to take students, especially uh, if, you, if you're coming, going uh, on vacation go to Montgomery, go by the old bus station. It's amazing to see what it looked like. Mm -hmm. Zeta Alpha Chapter, uh. Phi Beta Sigma Fraternity Incorporated, Tennessee State University, 1962 April, go. Correct. Well, one of the things I needed uh, when I got back to Nashville, I've been, I've been in so many, uh, I've been in jail so many times, I guess, and so many problems. Phi Beta Sigma brothers took me in. And we had a uh, young man named uh, uh, McKinney, who lives in Washington D.C. now. Uh, they was the people. They were the brothers that that really made me feel like I wanted to become a Sigma. And so in 1962, I joined Phi Beta Sigma uh, in Nashville, Tennessee, now, Tennessee State. Now, 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 help me out. What does culture for service and service for humanity mean to you? Yeah, that's one of the things that. Uh, I guess what I've been doing the rest of my, all my life, I definitely believe that uh, it's up to older men and up to brothers like Phi Beta Sigma to really help the young, young uh, men at day, at day, at day and time. It's amazing that, uh, and it bothered me real bad to see young men walk around, uh, can I sit that with the pants hanging down? And, and it's, it's tough, and that is real tough for me. 
I just can't believe that uh, that that fad will last that long. And I definitely think that it's going to take uh, old civil rights icons to help make this change. And uh, I'm hoping that you'd have more more people join the civil rights movement. Uh, I've been on the road for 50 some years now in the civil rights movement. Uh, but we're still going to need some younger brothers to really help take, uh, make a change in the United States, make it this world. You know, we were talking about the fact that the president is out mm -hmm. in town today. Right, uh, that's right. For a speech. Mm -hmm. uh, what did you feel on November the 4th, 2008, uh, when the United States of America elected their mm -hmm. first African American president? Mm hmm, mm hmm. Matter of fact, I did a speech uh, last week, and uh, I always tell the kids, it make my heart fill with joy when I think who lives at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue in Washington, D.C., the Obamas. That's great. Mm -hmm. the greatest temporary housing in all of America. <laughs> greatest temporary <laughs> housing in all of America. Right. That's right. That's right. But I want, I want to go back a bit. I want to go back. You sacrificed a lot. Mm-hmm. You went to jail over 19 times. You and Congressman Lewis shared a jail cell together. Oh, yeah, I forgot. You walked mm -hmm. on those back streets of tennis, of, 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 uh, of Alabama together trying mm -hmm. to find a place just to settle down. When you look out at society in 2016 and you see in cities like Chicago and Philadelphia and Newark the gang violence, most mm -hmm. of it mm -hmm. black on black. Black on black, right. When you, when you see our young men and young women dropping out of school, mm -hmm. not completing their education, when you see, and I always like to say this, Big Mama raising her second and third generation of children. Oh, definitely so. Because two folks committed the act, but mm -hmm. didn't have the courage to stay and raise what That's they brought into this world. That's correct. When you see our brothers and sisters not exercising their right to vote. Correct. Something that you... And, and other civil rights icons were beaten and almost died for. Mm -hmm. Give these young people some encouragement today. Tell them why they need to stand mm -hmm. up and, and, and not take the rights that they have for granted. One of the things that, um, that, uh, that also bothers me, and I've had major discussions with that, in, uh, especially in my Bible study, and, uh, and also doing, a, doing Sunday school. One of the things that bothers me is that is that, and they tell me all the time, the problem is that children are raising children. When you got a, uh, a parent that have a child at uh, 14, 14 years old, and they don't, know how to, how to, how, they don't know how to cook themselves, they don't know how to take care of themselves. And I saw the other day where we were talking about it, uh, there was a young lady less than, 25 years old and, and four children. Now, I don't see how that happened, but something is wrong with that. I think we got to get to a point where we got to t talk, to these, talk to these kids and make sure that they understand that uh, in order to get somewhere in this world, you got to help make a change. And you can't do it uh, just having, having children. Now, when I spoke down uh, Jacksonville probably a couple years ago, and I looked at statistic. You have 40, what, 44,000 children dropping out of high school in one year's time. Something wrong with that. When you got, um, especially when the fact that you got children going to bed, and not only in foreign countries, but in this country, going to bed hungry and getting up hungry. Uh, going to school, I taught school for a couple of years. Uh, four or five years, I guess. Going to school hungry. Now, when I taught school, all my kids ate. And I, I, when I say it too loud, my principal, well, he's gone now. But I used to make sure when the tickets came around for my kids to eat, if I didn't pay for it, I swiped a few tickets and gave them to my kids. Because you, you cannot learn if you're hungry. And you definitely need, they got lunches now. They got uh, free lunches for, for now. You know, back during the time when I taught school, there was no free lunch. And I'm just hoping that uh, we'll get more young people to start taking the role of uh, trying to lead. I did a speech not too long ago too, is that the Freedom Ride is not over. 
The freedom ride is not over. We still got problems in this world. Have you been following the Black Lives Matter movement? Oh, yeah, yeah. Matter of fact, I got a sign. It was in Selma, uh, during the Selma March. And they was really prevalent down in, in Selma. Been following the movement. But I'm hoping that time that they just don't take, a, take advantage of uh, what's going on to get in the movement. I'm hoping they got a strategy. And I've been, I've been in several meetings with them. Got a strategy to help make changes in, this, in the United States. I just can't believe that when I, when I see places like Chicago and, and it's on a weekend, you know, eight or ten blacks being killed just on the weekend. Mm -hmm. You know, something wrong with that. Brother Harbor, I, I can't tell you uh, how much of a blessing uh, it is to sit here with you. Thank you. Uh, and, mm -hmm. to, and to relive your experiences. Mm -hmm. uh, it's important for us to share this information, not only with the members of Phi Beta Sigma Fraternity, um, but with the world at large. Okay. Uh, to let them know that there are still people here that fought, bled, and suffered uh, mm -hmm. so that we might have. And, and in saying that, I know you've been on the road a long time. Right. As a matter of fact, when I think about you, I think about one of those old Negro spirituals. I'm on the battlefield uh, for <laughs> my, my Lord. My Lord. Mm. And I promised him that I would serve him till I died. Like You're still serving. That's correct. And, and you've taken on a new project. Uh, mm -hmm. I'd like you to tell us a little bit about Freedom Rider Park. Okay. When I talked about the fact that uh, the bus was burning in Anderson, Alabama, uh, where the bus was burned, and where the old store used to be, the county gave me the five acres. I said, gave me. We got two co-chairs. I'm a co-chair, and the fellow you saw just left, he's co-chair, uh, Pete Conroy. They gave, uh, I established a board of directors, and what we decided to do was build a Freedom Riders Park. One of my major things I want to do uh, before I leave, too, is that I'd like to see a Freedom Riders trail where the buses start in Washington, D.C., throughout uh, uh, Jackson, Mississippi. And, and young folks can get on the, on the bus for a school trip or whatever and leave, leave Washington, D.C. and stop in some of the old bus stations that are still there. We got a couple in Alabama still there, some in Mississippi still there. But back to the, the land in Alabama, uh, the county commission gave me $50,000. Uh, the... The city gave me fifty thousand, and I got a hundred thousand from um, from one of the state representatives. There, we're looking at doing a uh, Freedom Riders Park. The park will look like uh, it will be used, you know, for, especially during the summertime, not only for people that's traveling and visiting, uh, but also for school systems. They can come in the park and they can walk the Freedom uh, around the park and look at what happened. We'll have Hank Thomas in there. We'll have Janie Forsythe in there as a little replicas uh, at the park, and we'll hope that, uh, that we can get, uh, get this done soon. Uh, we've been trying it for a while, but it takes time, but we're still going to make sure it happens. Okay. Brother Harbor, tell us about your release from Parchment, Mississippi, that penitentiary that you spent 49 days in. That's correct. Mm -hmm. One of the things I talked about earlier is that, um, that the parents of the students during that time had major problems also. I wrote my mother uh, 10 days before I got up out of prison and told her I'd be coming home. Uh, and she wrote me back and told me, said, son, uh, it's best not you come home right now. So the Ku Klux Klan has been sitting by the house, uh, watching our house. Uh, we had to take the telephone out and, uh, and everybody know you in Piedmont. Since you had a Piedmont, a small town I told you about. So I got my mother's letter and it really bothered me. The fact that I couldn't leave uh, Tennessee, I couldn't leave jail and come home. So I left and went back to uh, Nashville, Tennessee and stayed in Nashville three full years before I was able to come home. Mm. Now, in the letter my mother said that uh, the Ku Klux Klan had been down my grandfather's house. They had been down uh, my uh, uncle's house, 
looking for me and wanted to know that was I was the same person that drove the school bus when I was in Alabama. So one of the things that, uh, that bothered me too is that my mother said, she, she said, son, will have a heart attack uh, if you come home because I know these folks are going to kill you and they're looking for you now. So please do not come home. And like I said, it was three years before I really went home. All the kids in school would leave and especially for the Christmas holidays and uh, I had to stay in Nashville. For the, uh, the summers, I stayed in Nashville and worked and, and didn't go home. But eventually, uh, I think my fourth year, I went back home to Piedmont, Alabama. How did that make you feel that your family mm -hmm. really was being harassed oh, oh, yeah. as a result of your activities in the movie? How right. did that make you feel? Well, my father always stated that, uh, they asked, he asked my father, said, said, can't you get that boy to come home, uh, get that boy to stop? But my father always said that uh, I got him through high school, I sent him to college, he's on his own. Uh, I hated that my family was harassed that much, but my mother said she always knew that something had to happen to make changes uh, in society at that time. It made me feel bad. And also it made me feel bad that, you know, my sisters and, and brothers were still in Piedmont, Alabama. And they would come to Nashville every, every so often to see me. But I, I just couldn't go home and, you know, see all my other friends. Well, Brother Harbor, I think there needs to be a Freedom Rider Park. Uh, Thank you. I appreciate I'm that. I'm in alignment with you. Uh, and and I, I've got 16 months left uh, in my presidency, uh, Phi Beta mm -hmm. Sigma Fraternity Incorporated. Right. And uh, there's a certain point where we as presidents start counting down the months, put a little oh, calendar okay. up on the wall and just start writing check mark. When can I be free? <laughs> yeah. uh, but, right. but in the 16 months that we have left, uh, I'm going to present your plan to the board, to the fraternity. We want to support Freedom Rider Park. Uh, I appreciate that. I think I can say that with all confidence. Um, I would also say to you we need it because, you know what, I've got a nine-year-old. I've got a five-year-old. Mm -hmm. They right. go to private schools. Uh, mm -hmm. They wear uniforms every day. Uh, they're in an integrated system. But they need to be able to go someplace where they can learn that it hadn't always been this way. Correct. Uh, right. So we'd mm -hmm. love to be able to bring them to Freedom Rider Park. Brother Harbor, this has been a joy. Thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. and, 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 and I want to thank you on behalf of a grateful fraternity uh, mm -hmm. for what you've done uh, in this movement. Uh, we haven't always been able to go to right. the Marriott Hotels for our conclaves to the <laughs> Right, you're right. But we now can go there mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. of people like you. Uh, so you. I want to thank you for giving up your time today. Uh, mm -hmm. I want to thank you for the work that you continue to do. And as you told me uh, when we first talked, uh, I made the mistake of saying, I'm so glad we found you. And mm -hmm. you said, Brother Mason, I ain't been lost. I've been here in Atlanta <laughs> all along. I'm right. glad we know you're here. And okay. I want to walk shoulder in shoulder with you as we continue to make a difference in the lives of our community and for me, most importantly, in the lives of our next generations coming up. Because mm -hmm. until all of our children can have a seat at the table of success, none right. of us has a seat at the table of success. Never what would you sure. like to share with our, our viewers before mm -hmm. we leave today? I definitely appreciate uh, this interview. I'm hoping that, uh, that a lot of young, young people will see it. I definitely appreciate it. I think it will change, uh, change some lives. I think it will change some minds. And I definitely want uh, the young Young generation know that this always not always haven't been the same as today. You know, it used to be tough, and and in some cases it's still tough. But we got to help help make the change with uh, with the young men and young women. All right. Thank well, you very Robert, much. Thank you so much. We appreciate, appreciate you. It. Thank you. All right.